A year and a half later, and the day has finally arrived, your pastor is here. Um, Folks, I was here about a month ago for the um, Bible Symposium and seminar regarding the Godhead and the Holy Spirit and the Trinity. And I tell you, I was so overwhelmed by the warm welcome that I have received from you as a church. Uh, I I had to sleep. (laughs) I mean, you you were so welcoming. And and I just praise God um, that, that I get to be here and that I get to now continue this next chapter in the journey of our life together in serving the Lord and and connecting this community to Jesus Christ. Um, I want to say thank you to Pastor John Scott, who was so kind to leave out in the mention of our story and our journey to uh, Hope Camp Meeting that during that week I was speaking with the early teens and I had actually lost my voice uh, on a Monday, but thank God I regained it on a Friday and I could finish the week out in preaching. And uh, again, thank you for being here, Pastor John. Um, he does an amazing job in working with our youth and our young adults. And I know that my youth from Niagara Falls and St. Catharines, um, they love him and they speak very highly of you and the work you do. It's interesting, John got to actually be at Niagara Falls uh, the Sabbath, my last Sabbath at Niagara Falls, and he's here today for my beginning of my journey with you. So uh, <laughs> I, I think that's funny how the Holy Spirit just kind of works that way. By way of introduction, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I was born and raised in Newfoundland. Yes, I am a Newfie. Um, my family actually came over from England in the 1600s and settled in Newfoundland when it was illegal to do so, so I come from a family of criminals. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, we, we lived off the land. We were, we were hunters and fishers, and you'll discover that I have a very real passion for fishing. And if you're a fisherman and you like to fish, we're going to become very fast friends. Uh, fishing is a biblical sport, by the way, just putting that out there. But it's interesting that not only do I like to fish, but then God took the opportunity to make me a fisher of men. Um, Folks, uh, when I was, uh, you heard me talk a little bit, um, if you were here that weekend for the uh, symposium, I got to share a little bit about how we became Seventh-day Adventists. I was nine years old when my father returned to the faith. Um, I didn't grow up Adventist, but I tell you, as soon as I encountered the three angels' message, it just changed my life. Um, So much so that I I wanted to follow the Lord and serve. I went to Berman University. I first started in theology, and then I made a transfer over to behavioral science. And my background and my practice has actually been community mental health, addictions counseling, and family preservation. I've also worked in Aboriginal child welfare and coordinated a program that actually helped put families back together. And praise God, we were very successful at that. Um, I received the call to come and pastor. Actually, I started out as a lay pastor. Um, the church family kept in Sylvan Lake, uh, where I, I served as an elder and head elder for some 15 years, were like, why aren't you a pastor? Why aren't you pastoring? Why, why aren't you pastoring? And then I got invited to pastor a small church. It was called Rocky Mountain House. And then from there, I received the call to go and pastor back home in Newfoundland. And I was there in Marystown for a couple of years. I got called here, St. Catharines and Niagara Falls, and now I'm here with you. Um, When I was at Berman University, or CUC back in the day, I met my wife, Cynthia Deer, there. She was a prairie girl, a farm girl. Her her father um, was into grain and cattle. And we married, and after three years, actually after three years of dating, we married. Uh, We have two children together. my son Justin, who's the youngest, and my daughter Caitlin, who is um, our firstborn. She's 25. Justin will be 22 soon. Caitlin just recently got married to uh, Stepan Golovenko. Her father is Dr. Pastor uh, Golovenko, and he's pastoring in Windsor, Ontario. And when he heard that his son was going to marry another pastor's kid, he said, Oh my goodness, you're going to be perpetually poor for the rest of your life. <laughs> so, um, but. Uh, Uh, A couple of years ago, in 2015, my wife passed away, actually 11 months after my mom. And 2015 was a tough year. Um, But thank God that we have a different belief when it comes to death, do we not? 
I mean, I praise God that, you know, our story does not end here, but we will see those whom we loved and we cared about in the resurrection. So having said that, um, I am not a single man anymore. Uh, I have met somebody um, whom I have uh, fallen in love with, and uh, her name is Baata. And honey, if you're watching, I know you're working today, but you'll come back and you'll watch this later. I know you will. Um, she's a wonderful, beautiful lady, and she's an RPN. She's working at the Welland Hospital, works in extended care. Uh, she has a daughter, Amalia, and a son um, who is uh, Jakob. And uh, Baata was uh, born and raised in, in Poland, came over when she was 12. And folks, you're going to love her. I love her. I know you're going to love her. Now, that's just a little introduction into who I am, folks. Um, it's going to take me a little bit to get to know all of you, and it's going to take me a little while to remember all your names. So if there's a quiz at the end of this, I'm in trouble. So please bear with me. It will take me some time, but I want to get to know each and every one of you. You will discover that I have three core values that I live by as a pastor. My first core value is this, people matter. And people matter because people matter to God. Amen. My second core value is God is for us and not against us. Amen. And because God is for us, life's better with Jesus in it. Amen. And so my mission is to connect as many people as I can to Jesus. Amen. Folks, I need to ask your permission to do something this morning. And that is to preach. Yes. Because I'm looking at the time. And I know we're into overtime. But some of the guest game plays happen in overtime, do they not? So would you please give me permission to share with you some thoughts I have about this idea of reaping and sowing. Can I do that this morning, please? Let's start with a word of prayer. Father God in heaven, we're about to get into the word. And as we open up the word, as we look at this principle we found in Galatians chapter 6, and as we learn what it means to truly impact and influence the lives of those around us through the planting of good seed, I am praying, Father, that the Holy Spirit would be poured out so that we would not only read the Word or that we would just hear the Word, but that, God, we would be changed through the reading of the Word. And so I'm praying right now, as we prayed a little earlier, that you would help me speak and teach me what to say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, my message this morning is entitled, For Every Action. Is there somebody here who can help me finish that statement, that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction? Do you know who said that? Isaac Newton said that. Isaac Newton had two passions in life. His first passion, and I don't think many people realize this, but his first passion was actually for the Word of God. Newton was a bit of a theologian, and he would write Bible studies and sermons, and he would love to get up and preach, and most people don't, don't realize that this brilliant man had a passion for Jesus Christ and the Word of God. His other passion, which he is more known for, is his passion for math and science. Newton was brilliant. Do you know that he actually created his own math? One day he was actually working on this mathematical equation. He had this math problem, and he was working on it, and he just couldn't fix or resolve the problem, and he was using advanced algebra, and he was just not getting anywhere with the math. And then it occurred to him that the problem wasn't with himself. The problem was with the math he was using. It wasn't advanced enough. So what do you do when advanced algebra isn't advanced enough? Oh, you go create your own math. I mean, that's what you would do, right? So Newton created what we now call calculus. What he's much more famous for is his discovery of gravity. Well, he didn't discover it. He just kind of gave it a name. Now, as the legend goes, one day he was sitting in an apple orchard, and an apple fell and hit him on the head. And this is my favorite cartoon depicting that event. <laughs> Nothing yet. How about you, Newton? The truth of the story is, is that one day he was walking in an apple orchard, and he saw an apple fall, and that got him thinking about gravity. Now, as uh, Pastor John um, indicated, I love props, and unfortunately, my prop for today was uh, kind of uh, packed away still, but imagine I have here a, a, a tennis ball in my hand, and we kind of think of gravity as what goes up, must come down, right? And so he discovered gravity, but what also he is known for 
is Newton's three laws of motion, which is kind of what I want to focus on here this morning for a little bit. His first law of motion is this. Things at rest, yeah, things at rest stay at rest, and things in motion stay in motion. His second law is the more force you apply to an object, the faster it will go. And then this is the one I want to focus on the most. It is Newton's third law of motion, and it is for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now, again, imagine I have that rubber ball in my hand. If I were to throw that ball at the floor, that would be an action. The reaction would be the ball would bounce back up off the floor. Now, here's what you need to know about Newton's laws of motion and the laws of physics. They work whether you believe it or not. Amen? But now some of you are looking at me and maybe you're thinking, okay, Pastor Bob, great physics lesson, but really, what does this have to do with my relationship with Jesus? Well, what if I told you there is a law, a spiritual law in Scripture that works just like Newton's for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, and that this spiritual law works whether you believe it or not? Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Galatians. It's back to our scripture reading. It's Galatians chapter 6, and this time I want to focus on verse 7. Again, Galatians 6 and verse 7. And it reads, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Now, if you're the kind of person who likes to take notes, circle that word in your Bible, and you could write beside it these three words. Don't kid yourself. Now, why would the Bible say, don't kid yourself? Because this law works whether you believe it or not. It's kind of like the laws of gravity. Anybody here believe in the law of gravity? Anybody believe that the gra gravity is a very real physical law? I actually met a person who doesn't believe in gravity. So I challenged them to make a trip to Toronto. And uh, I asked them, to, I, I, I challenged them, I want you to go to Toronto and I want you to go to the CN Tower. And I want you to climb all the way up to the top. It's 553 meters, or for our American friends, it's over 1,800 feet. And I said, I want you to stand at the top of that tower and say to yourself, Newton was a nut, Newton was a nut, there is no such thing as gravity. And then I want you to step off the CN Tower. Now, folks, let me ask you something. If my friend were to step off the CN Tower, would they fall? Yes. And would that fall kill him? Yes. Actually, it's not the fall that kills you. It's the sudden stop at the bottom. <laughs> but you understand that if you were to jump off the CN Tower, you will die. Because this law works whether you believe it or not. And the same is true. You will reap what you sow, and it works whether you believe it or not. So with that in mind, I want to share with you four principles I've learned about this whole idea of reaping and sowing. And I want to just share that brief, briefly now with you for the rest of this morning. The first principle is this. Okay, I'm going to say it, and then we'll bring it back up. Everybody sows. You see, sometime this week, you went shopping. You went to the gas station. You went to a restaurant. You got some fast food, and a person served you, and you sowed some seed into their life. Well, maybe this week, you went to work, and you talked with a coworker, or you came home, and you spent time with family, and you sowed some seed into their life. Well, you picked up the phone. You talk to a neighbor or you talk to a friend and you sowed some seed into their life. Because you see, every time we interact with another human being, we influence and impact that life for good or bad. And those are the seeds you sow and everybody sows every day. You came here to church. You hugged a person. You shaked hands. You interacted with one another. You influenced and impacted and you sowed some seed. Everybody sows. John Donne, back in the 1600s, made this statement, no man is an island. 
Now, he wrote that back in the day when they were advocating separation from everybody else. Stay away from your neighbors. Stay away from those other countries. Stay away from those other groups of people. But Dunn said no man is an island because he understood the influence and the impact that every human being has on other human beings. Nobody is an island because everybody sows. Parents, you need to hear this statistic. By the time a child reaches the age of 16, they would have heard some 117,000 negative messages about themselves. In that same time frame, they will have only heard some 16,000 positive messages about themselves. It takes at least four positive messages to undo the power of one negative message. Let me ask you something. When we speak something good or something bad into somebody's life, which are they more likely to believe? The negative. 117,000 negative messages by the time you're 16, and then we wonder why our youth are in trouble. So knowing this, one year I decided I wanted to take this Bible text and teach it to a group of young people. And it reads, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. I think Jesus understood the same problem we're having today. So I decided I wanted to take these kids out on a spiritual retreat and teach them this principle. So my co-worker in ministry, my friend Rod Eskelson, who who co-led youth in Sabbath school with me, he said, you know what, I got a great idea. Why don't we snowshoe to a cabin in in a remote part of B.C., take the kids there, and and, and just have a weekend together? And I thought, wow, that's a really great idea. Have you ever planned a family trip and anything that could go wrong went wrong? Anybody been there? Well, we drove out to B.C., and the place was called Ozalenka. And when we got there, we discovered that they had had just some fresh snow. There was three feet of snow on the ground. And it, began to dri- and it began to drizzle. Do you know what happens to snow when it gets wet? Come on, you're living in Canada. You know what happens to snow when it gets wet. It makes a really great snowball, doesn't it? Because it clings together. So we took, every step we took, I kid you not, we're wearing snowshoes, we got backpacks. Every step we took had at least this much snow at the bottom of the snowshoe. And some of those kids had never gone camping before, so they didn't know what to pack. I kid you not, one kid packed 12 cans of Dr. Pepper for this trip. One girl took eight books. Another one took, I I think it was the whole uh, beauty salon section from the mall. Um, (laughs) uh, One of them brought a hair dryer to the woods. (laughs) I don't know what she was going to plug it into, but some of them had packs that were 40 pounds in weight, and many of them hardly weighed 110 pounds soaking wet. Suffice it to say, there was some pain involved in this journey. Some of them lost their Christian experience. (laughs) I overheard a couple of them say, we can kill them in their sleep. (laughs) Yeah. Well, fortunately for myself and Rod, We had a good meal that night. The kids slept well, and the next morning was the Sabbath. And we had a great Sabbath experience worshiping in the mountains of B.C. Well, that night I hauled out this Bible text, and we talked about the importance of sowing good seed-like encouragement into one another's life. And so I turned to the young person who was sitting next to me, and I told them what I liked and what I loved about them. And then that young person got to sit there while 14 other young people got to tell this person what it was we all liked and loved about them. And we did that for every single kid in the room. That was 18 years ago. 18 years later, they're still talking about that trip. And they say, yes, we were ready to kill you. Yes, that was a tough journey. But what what made that the best worship experience we have ever had was the fact that you poured love and affirmation into our lives. Everybody sows. 
And folks, that seed you sowed this week, I got to ask as your new pastor, that seed you sowed, was it a good seed or was it a bad seed? And now the reason I ask that is because of principle number two. You do reap what you sow. Is there anybody here who loves to garden? Any gardeners in the church? I love gardening, and I especially love eating things that I've grown in my own garden. Growing up, my kids would come into the house and say, Dad, I'm hungry, and I'd say, you know where the garden is. There's nothing better than fresh peas and sweet baby corn. Do you know what I hate about gardening? The weeds. I hate weeds with a passion. And if I see a weed, I, I am, I, I, like, I'm after it. I'm going to just dig it out of my garden right now. Jesus tells the story of a landowner who goes out and he plants some good seed. He's a farmer, and he wants to grow some wheat. So he and his servants spend the day. They go out into the fields, and they sow some wheat. And then Jesus said, later that night, an enemy came along and sowed weeds into that man's crop. And I'm like, you better believe he's an enemy of you sowing you know, weeds in my garden. Then eventually, the good seed and the bad seed began to produce a crop. And the servants could see that not only do we have wheat, but we've got some, some tares, we've got some weeds growing in the garden. And they went running to their landowner, to their master, to the boss. And they said, boss, what do we do? We've got weeds growing in with the wheat. And they said, do you want us to go out and pull it up? And the farmer said, no, don't do that, because you might pull up the good with the bad. Now, we all understand in that story, if you've heard it before, that the wheat are who? Those are God's people. And the tares are? Well, those are Satan's people. So a question I have for you this morning is this. How do you know the difference between who is God's people, the wheat, and who are Satan's children, the tares? How do you know? It's as simple as this. By the seed you sow. You see, Jesus said, a good tree does not produce bad fruit. And a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. And he said, by their fruit, or may I say this morning, by your seed, you will know them. And you see, everybody sows. And the question I'm asking is, was it good seed or bad seed? Because I can tell what kind of Christian you are. By the seed you sow. And by the way, if we want a healthy church... Because now we made a commitment here this morning. We committed together to not only connect with Jesus Christ, but to create a healthy church community. And folks, I want to tell you something. The seed you sow will determine the kind of crop you get, or I put it this way. To get the right harvest, you have to plant the right seed. So you would know that if I want cabbages, I don't plant corn. And if I want corn, I don't plant carrots. And if I want carrots, I don't plant Peas. In the same way, if you want a healthy, loving, committed church that wants to be like Jesus, you can't sow gossip. You can't sow bitterness. You can't sow anger. You can't sow indifference. If you want a healthy church, you have to sow healthy seed. And that means you're going to have to be like Jesus. You're going to have to let the fruit of the Holy Spirit grow in your heart. Because what's in you is what's going to come out of you. And that's what you sow. And everybody sows, and what you're sowing is into the lives of other human beings. You all have an influence, and you all have an impact. And if we're going to be healthy, and if we're going to be ready for Jesus to come, you got to sow love. you got to be patient. you got to have kindness. you got to have compassion, because these are the fruits of the Spirit. And if we allow the fruit to grow in our lives, it will pour out of us so much so that what we produce and the harvest we will get is a healthy church, a light into this community that people will be drawn to because people are drawn to healthy. Amen. As my son would say, healthy is sexy. <laughs> but people are drawn to healthy. And so, folks, in order to get the right harvest, you have to plant the right seed. And this brings me to my next point, which is this. There will be a harvest. You cannot plant seed and there not be a harvest. I want to read this passage to you. Give and it will be given to you. 
a good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. In other words, you get back what you put out. There was a farmer whose cash crop is sunflower seeds. And this one particular year, it was a bad summer, kind of like the summer we just had. I don't know what it was like for you in Ottawa, but down in St. Catharines and Niagara Falls, we had a lot of cold and a lot of rain this summer. And, uh, and, and, and folks, uh, you, you can imagine what that does to a person's crop. And this man had the same kind of summer, and his crop was, it was a poor crop. And when he sold his seed and he counted up uh, all of his costs and how much money he made, he sat and he spoke with his wife. And he said, I don't know that we're going to have enough money to buy all the seed we need to buy this coming year. And he says, I got some tough choices to make. And he said, one of them is tithe. He said, if we pay tithe, uh, I don't know that we're going to be able to buy all the seed we need. But then he understood this principle here in Scripture where it says, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So claiming this as a promise, he and his wife paid their tithe. And of course, they didn't have enough money to buy all the seed he thought they would need to grow their crop. Well, they planted what they had. And guess what? It was a bumper crop that next year. As a matter of fact, there was so much seed, he didn't have enough barns and he didn't have enough storage to hold it all, so they began to put it into the trucks. Now, if you know anything about sunflower seeds, it is a light crop. And so they had to kind of pack it down, right? You needed a good measure and they needed to press it down. So what they were doing was they were, you know how after it rains on a dirt road, you get ruts in the road? Well, what they were doing is they were driving around on the farm through all the ruts trying to shake the seed down. And the seed had so much seed, it was actually spilling over the sides of the truck. And the farmer said they were exhausted trying to take all of that seed to market. Brothers and sisters, here's the point. You cannot plant a good seed and not get a harvest. Oh, oh, are you with me? You cannot plant a good seed and not get a harvest. Do you know why? Because God promises it. And when God says, I promise something, God delivers on his word because God cannot lie. And God says, if you measure it out, it will be measured back to you. Brothers and sisters, if we sow good seed, you want to evangelize, you want to grow this church, get out there and love people, be kind, be compassionate, sow that seed. And I tell you, you won't be able to hold or handle the amount of people God will bring to this church if it is a healthy and safe church to worship at. If we sow, we will reap, and what we reap will be a beautiful harvest. And folks, this leads me to my last point, which is this. Oh, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Is God faithful to his word? Yes. Amen. My last point is this. So even in times of famine. How many of you remember the story of Elijah where Elijah came to King Ahab and he said, Ahab, there's not going to be rain or dew in the land of Israel for the next three years. You remember that story? Folks, I want you to imagine that he prophesied the same thing for Ontario. What would happen to this province if we didn't have rain or dew for the next three years? Can you imagine how devastating that would be? I mean, I want you to imagine that the Ottawa River dries up. It is that dry. Well, it was so devastating that eventually even Elijah himself, the prophet of God, ran out of food. And so God says to Elijah, he said, Elijah, I've got this widow over here, and she's got this barrel with a little flour and some oil. I want you to go see her and ask her to provide you a meal. And, and to provide you a meal until this famine comes to an end. And so Elijah, being a prophet, he obeys God, and he goes to this widow, and when he finds her, she is collecting sticks for what she believes will be her last meal, the last meal on this earth for herself and her son. And she's gathering sticks, and along comes Elijah, and he says, God sent me 
to ask you for some food. Now, if you know the story, she shared her food with Elijah. But I want you to imagine what would have happened if that woman had turned to Elijah and said, are you kidding me? Buzz off. That truly would have been her last meal. You see, so many of us, when we come to a time of famine, our tendency is to be self-protective, and we tend to hoard rather than sow. You see, we tend to be consumers rather than givers, especially when we come to hard times. But when it comes to hard times, that is the time when we need to sow the most. And folks, hard times are coming. If you're looking at anything about Canadian politics, if you're watching what our government is right now doing, it won't be long before I'm in jail. It won't be long before they outlaw the preaching of God's Word in the pulpit. They're already working on, in California, the removal of religious materials in that state. Folks, hard times are coming, and that is not the time to hoard. That is the time to sow. There's a story about a lawyer who, he made, he made a good amount of money. He, he wasn't rich, but he wasn't poor. He just, he, he had a good income, and he also happened to be a hobby farmer. And uh, he was trying to increase his wealth, and so he was investing in the stock market, and he was one of those guys who just couldn't make a dime through investing. No matter what he touched, it just simply didn't work. Well, one day somebody came to him and, and they were talking to him about the Canadian Food and Grain Bank, and an organization that sends wheat overseas to help countries that are in need of food. And they asked him to take a portion of his land and just dedicate some of that wheat to the Canadian Grain Bank. And he talked about it and he, he prayed about it and, and he was talking to his wife and he said, you know... We don't have a lot of money. We don't have a lot of land. But I want to take 66 acres and just give it to the Canadian Food Bank, to the uh, Grain Bank. Well, that year they planted those 66 acres and then some, but the dedicated portion. And that year he got a bumper crop. They came back and they told him with the amount of wheat he got from that 66 acres, they could feed 1.5 million people for a day or a village of 1,500 people for a year. When that man died, he was actually able, through his investments, to leave his wife $150,000. This is back in the 70s, by the way, so that goes a little further back then. But do you understand? He wasn't a rich man. He didn't have a big parcel of land, but he took what he had, and in a time of lean times, in a time when he wasn't successful, he decided to sow seed and to give. And again, that principle came back. What you measure out will be measured back to you. Brothers and sisters, I know I've just arrived, but I have a vision for this church. That together, we're going to sow some good seed. I want people in this community to walk in through these doors and say, wow, you know, I, uh, I met those Seventh-day Adventists, and boy, wow, do they ever know their Bibles? I, I mean, we got into the Word of God, and they showed me things I'd never seen before. You know, I went over and I prayed with those Seventh-day Adventists, and let me tell you something. It wasn't one of those King James scripted prayers, but man, they talked to God like he's an actual, real, personal friend. You know, I I, I was working with those Seventh-day Adventists and we were working in the community and we had this project and I tell you, nobody gives like those Seventh-day Adventists can give. But you know, I went and I worshipped with those Seventh-day Adventists and let me tell you something. I felt an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I felt something happening in my heart and they introduced me to this Jesus guy and do you know that Jesus is kind, loving and compassionate? I so loved their picture of Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. It is 2018, and I'm inviting you, and I'm asking you together. Together, let's you and I sow some good seed, hoping and praying, knowing that God will deliver on his word, that we will reap what we sow, that there will be a harvest, and we're going to sow, whether it's in times of plenty or in times of famine, knowing that our our blessings will be so large. We won't be able to handle them. 
I am asking you to join with me to sow this one thing into the hearts of one another and the hearts of this world, this one seed, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can we at least covenant to do that together? Amen.